So I'm Sam Shah. I am the director for health data management for NIOM in the northwest corner of Saudi. I'm also a professor of digital health and I take the digital health research lead at University College London. Tech adoption and digital maturity are quite variable. We could look at digital maturity based on integration, connectivity, type of technology that's being used. We could look at digital maturity based on the outcomes for users and all of those different routes are sort of used. But if we take like a global view on this, I think digital maturity is very variable. We have some very few hospitals around the world or health systems that are incredibly digital mature. They're using lots of technology, they're very integrated, the data is flowing and they've managed to take themselves to a place where that data is analyzed, it's used and it is completely focused on the health, well-being and outcomes of its population, but also economic development. We have some health systems where they don't have any technology at all. Either they can't afford it, it might be that the maturity of the health system itself is pretty poor. So then it also means tech adoption is low. So where are we globally? Well, totally variable. We've got places like parts of the US that are incredibly digital mature, parts of the East, uh, some hospitals in Singapore and China that are incredibly advanced compared to other parts of the world. And then places like the Middle East, where they've almost got partly a blank canvas where new hospitals are being built from the beginning and they are completely digitally designed with digital twins from the very get-go. So it's variable. What sort of technology is driving these things? Well, a few years ago, Internet of Things was sort of the big buzz and that was still continues in background, but that's almost become normalized. Connected devices, virtual care is partly normalized. But if we also look at what else is happening, it would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that AI, and in particular the use of large language models, generative AI, has become a big driver in many health systems around the world. Now, that still does come with its risks because the models, the uh, technology itself has not necessarily in all parts been assured. Regulators are still catching up. So whilst it is a driver in those spaces where there is some regulation, that might also be rightly slowing down that adoption to make sure those systems are safe. But what are the other things that are happening? Well, we are seeing some resurgence of uh, distributed technology again, because now people are using that when it comes to licensing systems in, in health. But the new things, we're really seeing this movement now towards what some people call longevity, some people might call it long lifespan, it might just be well-being. And in that environment, we're seeing connected devices that are connecting the metrics of the individual and taking much more of a population health approach where individuals might be getting nudges, reminders, messaging on what could happen to improve their health. We're also getting health system planners, getting that data to perhaps change the type of system that's available. So those are some of the things, but we see that across connected technology and devices for virtual care in particular. We see the use of AI, both not just emerging, but the next level of that. And we also see this approach to well-being and connected data, the integration of data to try and get better outcomes. So the first thing is, is governance depends on what the model of regulation is for health data. In some areas like Europe, for example, you have the, Euro the European health uh, data space. And that basically means that there's consistency in theory across an area like Europe on uh, the health data transfer and the way that health data is used. Take the GCC. Across the GCC, you generally have some consistency in laws. They are different for each country in the GCC, but there's some consistency on the way in which at least data should be protected in uh, the various parts of the Gulf. And we see that particularly in Saudi, where they've got fairly new laws on uh, personal data, which is quite helpful. And we've got other places like the US, where you have HIPAA is the main form of regulation for health data. So you can imagine different places around the world have to comply to different extents, and that creates different governance frameworks, different challenges, but also brings about new solutions, whether that is synthetic data analysis, whether it's using trusted research environments, 
or whether it even happens to be under frameworks and uh, MOUs to try and agree how data is shared with different consent models. So that's sort of driving the governance. Then there's quality. Now, this is hugely variable. Because at a basic level, operational data in health systems is classically fairly good when it comes to quality, mainly because it's so linked to payment systems. So if we take places like maybe the US, or those systems that are very much based on a payer system, you tend to find that type of data quality actually is quite good because people are using it for payment systems. But if we take other places, perhaps those that are more publicly funded or those that aren't used to that type of model, you tend to find data quality tends to drop a little bit. So the quality of data is a challenge globally. And what we're seeing is some great vendors arrive where they've got systems that analyze data, that try and improve the quality of that data. And that's going to be quite exciting as that moves on, because that can, in the long term, perhaps even demonstrate where efficiencies could be found using that. But the quality of data is not static. It's not just operational data. It's not just health service utilization data we're interested in. We're now interested in genetic data, epidemiological data, and other data like from uh, adherence to medication. We are thinking about side effects. We're thinking about lots of data that we classically may not have collected in a consistent way that now forms part of the types of data set that we might want across health systems. And when we bring those things together and improve the levels of data, that data of high quality suddenly becomes useful and there's utility. And that's the sort of thing we're now thinking about. We're no longer just thinking about connecting operational data, but we're thinking about all of the different data sources about an individual health system that might help us get better outcomes. Then there's this level of integration. And there's some great examples, not only from places like the Middle East, but also other parts of the world where we're seeing products come together for integration. We've got things like, for example, in the UK and the NHS, they've got this uh, concept of integrated uh, records and we're seeing shared care record system. And the best example in the UK is, for example, one London. Then we've got other places like Abu Dhabi, where they've had Malafi for many years and it's very mature. And then we take Saudi where they've got Nafis and we're seeing these examples across different parts of the world where data integration is becoming more important. But that's also difficult because we have lots of different providers, different payers, different systems people are running on. And to integrate those things requires standards. And this is very exciting now because we're not only seeing these things happen in, within a country, we see them between a country. We see what's happened between Finland and Estonia where there's data sharing across a border. We see it between Germany and Austria to an extent. So the integration of data is going to the next level now. And what's interesting is how different countries, hospital systems, health systems, vendors and payers are solving this. And that for me is quite exciting because it could lead to even better insights being driven. And if we look at what insights are being driven, we've got insights about where people live, how they live, the sorts of things that are driving different health behaviors. We've got different ways of approaching wellness and we can learn from each other. Are, are there areas where we've got better outcomes on uh, cholesterol, on blood pressure, on heart disease, and why is that happening? We've got the ability to apply AI to get better insights for pharma and therapeutic development, just connecting up data. We might have AI-driven clinical trials. So these are some of the sorts of things that we can do if we can integrate the data, get the quality right, and of course, most importantly, protect the citizen through the best governance frameworks. I mean, this is very hard and uh, clinical decision support and clinical decisions are, of course, at the moment, those things that are so germane to the patient and the citizen. And we've got to get those things right. The liability and risk framework varies in different parts of the world. And we've got to be cognizant of this. Now, we can, of course, integrate different AI tools and products. But we have to think about a few things. We have to think about the infrastructure. We've got to think about the risks. And imagine this. We have a closed system. We plug in external players, we suddenly punch holes in that system at a crude level. When we do that, that potentially opens up vulnerabilities. And we have seen some pretty awful security incidents in different and those sorts of things that we have to be very aware of. We see what happened in the UK with the cyber attack, where an entire hospital went down because the laboratory system that was integrated in to the rest of the health system from an external player. That's an example where for weeks, 
the hospital was uh, not functioning properly and it took out a large part of the health system. There's, of course, been global attacks that we're aware of. So you've got to be very careful that on the one side, we, of course, want these new tools. But when we integrate them, we do have to take cybersecurity and security very seriously because not only could it affect the decision making, but it could take out an entire hospital system if a bad actor was to uh, damage those underlying systems. And so for that reason, when we're thinking about responsible adoption of AI, we need the right frameworks in place, the right cybersecurity measures in place, and think about the impact on a health system, because this is not going to be the same as necessarily taking out maybe a transport system, which of course is awful. But in this situation, when health systems are taken out by cybersecurity events, that can lead to bad decisions, or worse, it can lead to deaths. And so for that reason, we've got to take cybersecurity very seriously. And as part of the assessment of the adoption of any technology, that should be a core feature, assessing the clinical safety of those systems, the cybersecurity risks that are, uh, that are, that are created and how that they could be uh, mitigated. And also think about other things like data security and data protection and as we adopt those systems. Well, digital health uh, adoption in these complex systems isn't an easy task. And where we see it working well is where three things happen. The first thing is a strategy on digital health. It's not just piecemeal adoption, but something that is thought about across the maturity model of a health system. So having a really clear strategy is so important, which might include the types of technology, the types of training for the workforce, uh, the, the type of uh, time horizon that will be involved and what some of the outcomes are that are expected. The second thing that is so important is the resourcing. Most often I see health systems underestimate the cost of adoption of some of these technologies. But the reality is the cost model has changed. It's no longer just a capital expenditure, but it also involves revenue. So people have to think of both of these things and plan for it, because otherwise we don't see successful adoption. Because either the business change resource doesn't go in, or for example, we don't see the resource go in to pay for the equipment, or the training of the staff, or the technology itself. So we've got to make sure the resourcing is right. But most importantly, and I can't stress this enough, is the organizational design. And that is not simple as what are the, what's the operating model. It goes much further beyond that. When we adopt digital health, it might change the entire model of the delivery of care. We're redesigning the care pathway. And if that hasn't taken place, and the organization around that has not evolved or isn't ready to evolve, we see the failure of adoption of digital health. So we have some systems where they have lots of digital health adoption. For example, some parts of the Middle East have great digital health adoption, but it might be in a single hospital, not in an entire system. And we see other parts of the world where they've sort of gone to a more systematized approach. So if I think about certain places in the US, They've adopted an accountable care uh, organization model, but they've adopted digital health at scale, which might include the use of everything from apps and wearables for their citizens. We might have at the same time seen uh, um, digital health being used across not only the hospital system, but outside of that inclusion of virtual care. And then we see the data that is produced that is then used as part of the innovation ecosystem. That's just one example. But if I take other parts of the world, we see the same thing starting to happen. And there are certain uh, hospital systems I've seen, for example, in Singapore, where the entire hospital and its healthcare facility around it is uh, has been digitized. Uh, there's models of this happening in places like the Netherlands, in Australia, elsewhere. So it is not isolated. And we certainly see this happening in the Gulf, in parts of the Gulf, in the Middle East, particularly places like Abu Dhabi. We're beginning to see this. We're seeing this in Saudi Arabia. We're seeing this in Qatar. We are seeing the evolution of health systems that have taken the adoption of digital health very seriously. And they brought some creative minds in with experience to adopt these things. And that goes, the examples we see there are wearables for the individuals. We see the ability to individuals to track, the ability to use apps to integrate with their health system, to make it easier for them to access healthcare. The data available not only to them, but also to the clinicians seeing them the overlay of a population health approach in that same space, the connected devices, both in the hospital system and outside. So beginning to see this. And in some places, they've even started to adopt 
AI, and I mean AI at perhaps the most easy level, which is to help guide the citizen. But on the other side, AI for clinicians to support decision making. So you're beginning to see these different features come together and these digitally health mature uh, systems adopt these things with technology that has a benefit for citizens and clinicians, but overall also for the health system itself and the payer. Well, the biggest thing that we need to do for a data-driven healthcare system is improve the skill sets of the people working in these systems. And I don't just mean the clinicians uh, and the, the all of the, the nurses, physicians, everyone else in the system, but it also means both the leadership, the boards have to evolve with their skill set, the rest of the workforce has to go with them. So we do have to invest in training and skills for the healthcare workforce. But it doesn't stop there. We've got to improve the digital literacy of the populations that are using these things, because eventually we want to get to a point, especially in a preventative system, where citizens are engaged and enabled to use some of the technology directly themselves, especially where it's safe to do so. So you've got to improve the digital literacy of the population as well, the underlying population. And then on top of that, we've got to think about different models of funding these things because the traditional models aren't necessarily working. So we've got to come out with more creative ways of doing this, which might be the combination of R&D uh, and uh, using R&D as a model of extracting data that might help fund these digital health uh, systems. And then some of the other things that I suppose we need to do very strategically is think about how we share learning in a much better way, because all of us around the world are adopting technology at place, but we're not necessarily so good at sharing. And uh, that's why certain events like WHX Tech are so important because it gives people the ability to share with one another uh, that leadership to come together, exchange ideas, also exchange ideas of what may not have worked and that will help us evolve as systems. Well, I think the most important thing is, is it's really important that people connect with one another, they share what they've learned, they share what hasn't worked, and they explain what they do differently next time, so that the next person that's coming along to adopt digital health in their ecosystem, to try and make a difference to their citizen, is able to do that in a faster way, but in a way that gets to the better outcome at the other end. And so I'd highly recommend people to connect, share with one another, and keep on pushing the boundaries of digital health.